but I want you to be able to, to recognize that God is not only showing us, there are definite signs all the way around. You can see them. You've already embraced them, as have I. I don't have one of those things in my home. You probably got a smartphone or a tablet or, a t or you have the Internet or something like that. And uh, I'm not here to get on a, a tangent about all that. What I'm here to tell you, because we utilize that stuff and will until he calls us home. But I want you to know that it is really time to put your boots on. And I'm not the only one that's saying it, church. And this message that I'm about to share with you came Sunday night. The title of it. And what to do with it came Monday night. I told you just a moment ago that a lot of things in our lives, and you won't, it's sad, but you won't find out until you get to glory, I believe, were tucked away in time away in prayer, maybe in tithe or some other area of, of obedience. But the Bible speaks too much of miracles, signs, and wonders, and blessings, and all these kinds of things for the picture that we get from the church world today is people just crawling on their hands and feet trying to make it through the next day. And I know we all go through times and trying and testing times, but we do not look like a victorious group that the Bible said we were. And so Paul had ran into this already. And so he had to address it because he worked for God. He had strict marching orders. As so do all of us. And I'll read, read just a little bit of it, to, of it to you. It's in the first chapter of Galatians. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. According to the will of God our, and our Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ. To a different gospel. Which is not another. But there are some who trouble you. And want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you. Uh, other than what we have preached to you. Let him be accursed. As we have said before. So now I say again. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you. And what we have said, he will be accursed. Need to say that really three times, but I'm stopping it too. For I do not, for I do now persuade men or God. He's saying, do I please man or do I please God? And I think we all know the correct answer there. Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. That's strong right there, church. And if you go over one page, one chapter to chapter 2, verse 20, you know it. But we're going to say it together. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, <laughs> hallelujah, who loved me and gave himself for me. This week I was riding around and I said, Lord, we got a seal in the church. Talks about the harvest. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers. And it's like the Spirit of God stopped me midstream praying and said, I've already answered that prayer. Even with many people that are no longer here and are maybe other places or whatever, he said, 
I've still answered that prayer. And God reminded me, he reminded me of Gideon and his army. And the Lord just let me know, I've, I've, I've give you laborers. But the problem is, it's a Galatian problem. He said people are not laboring. They are, but it's not for the meat that doesn't perish. People laboring. This is not, this is not a message of condemnation. Now, it might be another message that starts with a C. It might be convicting like it's convicting me, but it's not. It's to, it's to build you up and pump you up and, and help you to see the game face you should be wearing while Google and everybody else is manipulating everything from the news to technology to, to everything around you, including politics, including every, everything. Everything under the sun is being manipulated for the... The structure of the Antichrist. And God says the laborers are there. And the Lord let me know even with just the, the, the ones of you that are here today. He said, son, do you know that you still have enough laborers in the church to do every ministry I have ever birthed in that church? It doesn't matter if it's feeding people on Fridays. It doesn't matter if it's putting up LOL. And you know we put up LOL seven times in 2000, not one time, one bit. We did it seven times. We did it when it was cold. We did it when the weather was great. We did it when it felt good. We've had gym ministry. We've had everything from uh, a thrift store. We've had summer camp. We've had uh, different things the youth have done. I could go men's ministry, ladies' ministry, Wednesday night classes for every age group. With every ministry you could possibly go back and trace since the inception of this ministry, God says you still got plenty of people to carry out every bit of that and more. And so God said the problem is it's a Galatian problem. And then the Lord let me know that it all goes back to the, the letter R. Re relationship church it goes back to the relationship and this is what what I want to kind of just go back to square one I don't want to get extremely complicated today because I want to get right to the point because I want you to really know the time and the day and the hour in which you are still alive to do something about it it all starts when you go to Calvary and when you go to Calvary, this is a sign of being saved, being born again. And you know how it goes. You kneel at the cross. And when you kneel at the cross, you begin to give your sins to the Lord. You begin to pray and pour your heart out. We, we call this at the foot of the cross or at the feet of Jesus. And we tell Jesus how sorry we are, how, how bad we feel about about transgressing his holy word and, and, not, and not living a life to the creator that created us. That's what happens when, when you surrender your sins to Jesus. And, and, and here's where the real problem starts being born or is birth. We, we start out and we begin a relationship with Jesus, and then we get up prematurely from the cross, you see. Because it's not just about giving your sin and then getting into a relationship with Jesus just so He's there when you need Him to be there. And this is where a lot of people, even in our own church, sitting all over this congregation today and many other congregations, this is where people are stuck because you've heard sermon, uh, illustration, you've seen a mime, you've heard another song, and we are stuck at having just knelt at the cross and, and, and it gets us to a relationship with Jesus, but it gets us in front of Jesus. And we block Jesus out. And do they see Jesus in me? When the world looks at me, do they see Jesus? And the true answer is, no, 
No, they don't see Jesus. They know I refer to him sometime. Or they've heard me call his name out sometime when I've been desperate or in a bad place. But the, the deal is that I got up from the cross too soon for the cross to do a work in me. I wanted to dump on the cross, but I did not allow the cross to dump on me. And we block. It's not that Jesus is not in your life. He's just not at the forefront of your life. And so God said it through Paul to the church at Galatians, and he's saying to me and you today, when you get down at the old rugged cross you've got to understand that unless you are so intimate with God you're on your way to hell because the work has to be completed we went all the way through the tabernacle you know about the animals you know about the sacrifice but the work starts here but it has to move from the ground your knees until you crawl up on the cross see you have to go from the ground to the altar and if you've not allowed your sin and yourself to be given over to almighty God there's no way you can walk you'll always be in front of Jesus your family will not be saved the people you love your children won't be saved your co-workers won't be saved you've got to get up from the ground sometime church and you've got to go to the cross and when you go to the cross it's going to be like a CSI moment it's going to be like you go to the cross and you lay down and you've killed your flesh. And you understand, I've, I've crucified myself. And now hell knows who you are. Hell knows that there's been a death. Hell knows you've already disarmed Satan and the demons. And now they can't use your flesh to keep you away from God. They know now you can't be used to be pulled away into lust and all those things because there's been a death. There's been a crime scene moment in your life. There's been a time when you've realized that I don't want my sin and I don't want no more myself and I've got to crucify this flesh or it's going to betray me again. And when your flesh betrays you again and again and again, You'll even hide Jesus. You won't even care if Google Home knows who Jesus is because you know who Jesus is and you still block him out. So it doesn't matter what Google or Siri or the government or this public school system or anybody else is doing because we've already filtered him. You see, we filtered him with our flesh and there has to be a death. There has to be a crime scene. There has to be the time when you are dead and then when you you are dead the Bible says something very wonderful happens he talks about it in Psalm 91 people used to couldn't see Jesus in your life they couldn't see Jesus anymore but now since you have crucified your flesh see he took care of your sins but you've got to take care he crucified himself he allowed himself to be so nailed to a cross so that could take care of your sins but it's up to you to take care of your flesh and when that happens all of a sudden something strange takes place you see in the heavens in the spiritual world I can't explain it too good but I'm going to do my best something takes place and you are no longer in the way there might be a little bit of a hazy outline but that's all you have to offer the world it's just a shell it's just a little vessel and and now people are looking, and oh yeah, when they look, oh they know, they know it was you, but they really see Jesus. So now people come to me at work, people come to me at school, my family, and when they come and they ask me for prayer, I'll say, well, I'll put you on the prayer list. I'll email the church. They come up to you, and when they nail, kneel down, it's like they touch you, and they're touching Jesus Christ, because Jesus, he bore not just our sins, but he identified with our infirmities and our grief. And see, now that people come to you, they're really not coming to you. They're coming to Jesus because there's nothing in the way. And nobody, not even me preaching today, can do this for anybody but myself. Nobody. Nobody can do it. Not another preacher. Not, not another soul living. You've got to decide today. Everybody talks about angels. 
everybody, and they have a place. The Bible tells us in Psalm 91, this is so clear. He says, because you have made the Lord. That means you decided, just like Angie, for 29 years now, the first day of school, first week, we just talked about this over the weekend. She tells those children every year, this year and your whole life is all about choices. It's all about choices. And you've got to do what Psalm 91 says if you want to get to the place where you're just an outline. Because you have chosen, you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. That means that's where you hang out. You hang out where the Lord is. You hang out where the things of God are. You don't try to fit church in if it doesn't conflict with anything else. No, you make everything else get in line if there's time left after your dwelling place. You have made the Lord your dwelling place. And since you've chosen to do that, guess what verse 10 says? No evil shall befall you. Neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And the only thing that's separating you from the protection and the goodness of God and the angels of heaven and the angels going before you and taking care of you and watching out for you is the old rugged cross. And I know a lot of you have knelt down at the cross, but you have not been nailed to the cross. And it's evident in your life. It's evident in your choices. It's evident in your giving. It's evident in your laboring and lack of laboring. It's somebody else's job. We've got two or three people paid at the church, and, and it's their job to do it. Let me tell you what needs done, and this is not about soliciting help, because now I have learned that if nobody's here to do it, God will equip the preacher to do it. That's why I sit on that keyboard and try to bang my way through it every Sunday morning, because God, I said, Lord, if nobody else gives a rip about you, I'll do it. I'm I'm going to live for you until I die. I don't have nothing better to do. You are my God. You are my hope. You are my health. You are my strength. You are my dwelling place. You are the one I want. And you know what? I have problems. I have trials. And I have tribulations. But it's good to know I'm never walking by myself. He's given his angels charge over me because I have chosen to make him my dwelling place. And you can do the same thing too. And God can do great and mighty things in your life. Hallelujah. God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. God wants to do a work so bad inside of this place. If you were here on Friday night of crusade, we touched it. We touched it. We just peeked inside the veil. You saw it. You saw what happened for an hour. People speaking in an unknown tongue. People laying hands on people. Hope they don't scare you. Straight out the word. But listen to me. God's got greater things he wants to do. And all he's looking for is a few people willing to be nailed. All he's looking for is somebody that's ready to walk with angels for a couple of days. All he's looking for is somebody that's ready to just sell out and say, Lord, I'm not going to get up prematurely this time, but I'm going to taste and see. Oh, Lord, I'm going to stay right here and dwell in the secret place of the Most High, Lord, and I'm going to watch what you do in my life. And I'm telling you, when you get nailed to the cross, people will come to you for prayer because they know they're going to get Jesus. They'll come to you for answers. They'll come to you if they've got stuff they need to get rid of rid of and give away oh yeah even prosperity comes when people see Jesus see everybody wants to give to Jesus because they know Jesus can do great and mighty things with what they have but it all goes back to the old rugged cross you don't have to beg anybody to give you don't have to beg anybody to work you don't have to beg people to show up for any function any time when people have been nailed 
to the cross. And all of you that's been saved for 25 years and longer, I am sorry. I'm glad I let another man of God tell you today. But you've got to divorce your rear end because what you did 40 years ago is no good to God in the kingdom today. Don't clap because I'm telling you, people don't want to clap and don't want to hear this stuff. We will jump and we will, we will crawl our way to the things of this world. We'll do whatever. We, if it's going to benefit me or mine, we'll do whatever it requires. And God knows if it's going to make our child look good, we, we will hog the house if we have to. But I'm telling you, there is coming a day. And oh, I believe, I'm showing you these videos, I'm committed to it, but I know it, I can feel it in my chest. I know the Lord's about to return. And my job is to preach the whole word of God and to point people the way. All I am, I'm like all you that went back to school. I'm just a traffic cop. I'm just pointing people. I'm just telling you that's all I'm doing. That's what the man said earlier. I'm just giving you fair warning, but that's all I'm doing. I'm just saying God wants to do what you've been wanting him to do for 30 years, but there's one factor. You're in the way. You're in the way. Paul was addressing the church at Galatia, and I'm talking to the people inside of this building right now. I'm not talking to the sinners out there. I'm talking to people that feel real good about your salvation. Because it'll be evident. You know what it is just with what's here today? We'll, we will have so many people that just won't, because all they are is an outline. They're dead, their passions, they're, that's gone. They, they took care of that when they knelt and were nailed. Have you had a CSI experience? Has there been a crime scene since you first believed? Has there been a crime scene generated since the day you called on the Lord? You tell me what God's saying. I don't look at my devotion book. This is the same one Angie read to you last Sunday morning. Same devotion book right before I left the house this morning. Now that I've preached what I've preached, this is what it said when I opened it up. September the 2nd. I, the guys probably can't get a shot of that, but that's fine. I hope you take my word for it. It says, Our stubborn wills repent Therefore, and be converted. And by the way, this is a Billy Graham hope for each day. Becoming a Christian is a once for all event in which we repent of our sins and cast ourselves on Christ alone for our salvation. When we are converted, God takes us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's 1 Peter 2, 9. But being a Christian is a daily, ongoing experience. It is a lifelong process of daily repentance and faith. Turning from sin and seeking to live for Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is where our wills come in. Although we have been converted and God has come to live in us. Our old nature is still alive and kicking. Our stubborn wills still demand to put self first instead of Christ. It isn't easy to bring our stubborn wills into submission to Christ. But when we do, it is as if a misplaced vertebrae has snapped back into place. Instead of the stress and tension of life... Out of harmony with God, we discover the serenity of his presence. Who will control you today? You are Christ. And then the little footnote at the bottom, it's, it's called hope for today. Each morning, we must choose to die to self again. We hand the reins over to Christ and give him complete control. Some days it's easy, some days it's not, 
but it's always best. I'm going to ask you to stand up if you're physically able all over this building.